Welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sift through philosophy and find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes. I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler. Today we're going to talk about... Stoicon and gathering. Now, if you thought that I misspoke just now when I said Stoicon instead of Stoicism, I, I'm not. It, it, actually, it's they're connected, but they're two different things. And... As we're, we're recording this and as you're hearing it, it's a little bit too late for Stoicon 2021 to go to the event, but we're, we're going to tell you about all the different cool ways that you can still get in on it and what a Stoicon actually is or what it, what it would be. And there's, there's not just Stoicons, right? There's also Stoicon Xs and there's Stoic Week. And at this point, you may be a little bit inundated with stoic sounding things so <laughs> what should we talk about first dan well we will get to all those lovely events that are happening over the course of this month here but the whole reason why we even have these in the first place is this kind of idea of a pro-social uh, mindset that you find within stoicism and just kind of like to kick us off, I'll bring in a quote from uh, Seneca the Younger, who's one of the, the three big you know, ancient uh, Stoic writers. And he's uh, writing this um, thing, I believe, to uh, the Emperor Nero on clemency and how to yeah. like, kind of like be, be, <laughs> be nice. It didn't, but he's talking. It didn't really stick, unfortunately. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and it, <laughs> it did, definitely stuck. Uh, you know, Seneca in the end. Yeah, that's true. We we can talk yeah. about we can tell that story if people want yeah. to hear it. I guess. <laughs> yeah, quick quickly. Well, so Seneca, you know, he he wound up being one of those people who was very successful, but you might say in the wrong way. So he gets brought back from exile, and exile was no fun back then. Um, and one of the one of the conditions was he had to be the tutor to this young soon to be emperor Nero and nobody knew at that time how bad Nero was going to be he just seemed like kind of a screw up and you know maybe you could work with him and as it turned out he was he was much worse than anybody ever figured him for being and Seneca you're right Seneca wrote this this uh, work on clemency he wrote a couple other ones like on anger to Nero trying to provide him guidance and it looks like Nero managed to snow everybody and none of this advice actually stuck. But we've got these great works that, that represent what Seneca would, you know, his advice to a reasonable person, <laughs> which right. Nero was not. And then, you no. know, uh, later on, Seneca tried to extricate himself from Nero's court. And it's like that, that line, is, that in, is it in The Godfather? What, what, it was Goodfellas, maybe. I keep trying to get out and they keep pulling me back in. Which, which one was that? Do you remember which movie? It was I one of those. I want to say Goodfellas, but uh, it's, they kind of meld together over the years. Yeah, so it was that sort of situation. Seneca couldn't get away from it. And then there was a plot against Nero. And as it turned out, a lot of Stoics were indeed involved in it. Seneca wasn't, but Nero put them all into one big group and said, Seneca, you're going to have to kill yourself. And you might say, well, why would you kill yourself just because somebody else tells you to? And the answer is because if Seneca didn't do that, then, you know, Nero would have killed everybody else close to him as well. So that it was bad end for, for poor Seneca, unfortunately. But he, he got to live pretty old. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and thankfully, we still have his writings. Yeah. So, so don't let me so hold speaking you back. Of, <laughs> so, um, in uh, On Clemency, he is speaking about stoicism in regard to community. And he says, quote, no school has more goodness and gentleness than has more 
love for human beings, nor more attention to the common good. The goal which it assigns to us is to be useful, to help others, to take care, not only of ourselves, but of everyone in general, and of each one in particular. That's a lot of so stuff, we, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and this is kind of like very much in contrast to what we are usually given uh, about like, you know, stoicism, kind of like, like a lot of the... Uh, the first or the early things that people are, are usually taught about it is something that's very like insular or talking about like the, your inner desires and your inner judgments yeah. and how to change those. And, um, and we often, especially if you're only skimming over the texts, you can miss that the whole point of these things are actually to, you know, become a, a better person to be a, a a paragon, a, a person of virtue, to live in accordance with virtue, and because we are these social creatures, and ethics kind of revolves around this idea of uh, how one treats others, that that is really the core of Stoicism. Yeah. Uh, just how you get to the point where you can actually treat others well is sometimes, uh, is often predicated by inner working. You know, and I'll I'll admit that when I was young and I read Epictetus's Enchiridion and then Marcus Aurelius's Meditations when I was a college student, I was one of those people who only took from it the parts I was paying attention to. I, and I think when it came to all these, um, and I like this term that you're using, pro-social, not just social, but, but pro-social, valuing that, valuing all these things that Seneca talks about, you know, goodness, love, common good, being useful, all that. I, I, I kind of think I, I treated that like window dressing. Like, ah, he doesn't really mean this stuff. You know, let's get to the real stoicism things, which are what you were talking about. You know, let's withdraw, be tough, you know, harden yourself against misfortune. And that led me to, to – there were two things that came from that. One was it led me to um, – take on an idea of stoicism that was a wrong-headed idea and then because there wasn't any really deep root there i kind of left it behind until um a decade later and when i when i actually started reading epictetus in a in a serious way so misunderstanding things doesn't give you a stoicism that you can really use effectively you know right it's it's a series of tools at that point in time, but without like the proper ends in mind, like where, yeah. what are you actually trying to use these for? Yeah. You could probably use a lot of these tools for lots of different ends, but you know, not to uh, call you a sophist or anything, but like, <laughs> <laughs> you can call me a sophist if you want to. It's not going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> but at, at the time you're yeah. using these for ends that are not exactly the, the things that were prescribed within the, uh, in the philosophy, you're using the fruits yeah. of the, this philosophy um, to to gain uh, ends that are you know potentially selfish. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up because I think a lot of people get interested in and attracted to Stoicism these days because they've run, they've run across some sort of popular author who attributes what's going good for them or you know the kind of work that they do to Stoicism. And it's, it's, it's often like a kind of um, superficial or you could say just partial treatment. So like the idea that, well, you, sh you should do stoicism because that's going to make you resilient and then you won't complain as much at work about the bad work conditions. Okay, stoicism can help you with that, but that's not stoicism, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's being used for a different end than that's, – than... That's just pure resiliency. Yeah, like, exactly. You know, and then – the, the stoic end there would be like, well, how can you make your uh, workplace not as bad as it is? Like, what what are the things that you can you yeah. know, pro socially do? You know, you can resist the the badness, but also you you have to place some sort of you know virtuous or or good uh, ends in that place. Yeah. So when when we have those kinds of and I, you know, we've talked in the past about like lowercase s stoicism and and uppercase s stoicism. I would say that this is something in between, you know, and it's it's not quite 
just a caricature. It is based to some degree in in you know reading Seneca or reading Marcus Aurelius, but it, it's it's um it's missing something. So like you know if your if your Stoicism is being studied so that you can um you know be a more productive worker or your your sports team can you know hold together better or something like that. That's not a bad thing. I mean, those are good things, but you're, you're missing out on something. And I, my, my personal hope is that the people that are attracted to um, stoicism through like Tim Ferriss or Ryan Holiday or any of these, these authors where the commitment is, is um, not as deep, let's say some other authors that these are gateways and they, they, they go on and study and, and learn more and then they get to appreciate um, what stoicism actually does have to offer to them. So, you know, off, off, Often we see that people have these, they, they find these inward things that allow them to become more resilient in this really stoic capitalist sense. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, these, um, the whole point is that these inward things are supposed to allow us to do those outward actions that are actually pro social. And so here's a, yeah. a quote from Masonius Rufus, the uh, teacher of Epictetus. And, you will earn the respect of all if you begin by earning the respect of yourself. Don't expect to encourage good deeds in people conscious of your own misdeeds. I mean, in a way, couldn't that become discouraging? Like, you, let's say you, you approach Stoicism the way that most of us do is kind of screw-ups, and you're like, well, Stoicism is going to help me be less of a screw-up. <laughs> and I already know a lot of people who know me as a screw-up, uh, so they're, you know, they're conscious of my misdeeds, my coworkers or, you know, fellow students or w- whatever, family members. Um, if you follow this, is, and I, I, I think that I'm sort of playing devil's advocate here. Isn't there, isn't there a risk that um, you would, you know, people would just kind of like brush you off and say, oh, you're, you're still the same screw up as you, as you were. I guess my response would be like if you are actually working on yourself then your actions are going to be following your current set of beliefs and the, the things that you're doing and over time people are going to actually see that um you know and you're always going to okay. run into people that you haven't seen in a very long time and they'll have this <laughs> this weird like association with you like they know you and they, you might have a lot of history with them but you are no longer that person yeah it's, I've definitely found this from like people that I, I've like I knew in high school, but I haven't like really hung out with in like a decade or more. And so that we all have these like ideas of what this person is, and that's it's related, but it's not quite the same thing. Yeah, I I published a book in 2011, and it was the fruit of like eight years' work, and it's you know it's a very scholarly book. It's it's not um, intended to be a popular work, and it's about a kind of obscure topic. And I was posting about it on Facebook. And at that time, I was connected with um, the principal of my former high school, Catholic Memorial High School in Waukesha. And he wrote me back and he said, I remember you. And you don't seem like the sort of person who'd ever have written a book, (laughs) let alone a book in philosophy. (laughs) And I thought that was, you know, kind of a nice endorsement um, about, you know, how I how I changed, but it, he was very surprised. You know, it came out of the the blue for him. But so if we if we think about that, so this affects the first part of that passage. You will earn the respect of all if you begin by earning the respect of yourself. It's not it's not kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps, look in the mirror, and say things like I respect myself to myself, right? It's because he's talking about good deeds. So how do you earn the respect of yourself? Is good deeds how, how you do it? Uh, I guess within uh, stoicism, that thing, which is the actual good are one's uh, thoughts, actions, like des- well, I guess desires and aversions and actions. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to get into like too much of the weeds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, my brain is 
get presented to me lots of ideas. I'm like, nope, that's a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, so all of those then could be ways in which you earn the respect of yourself. I mean, it's kind of it, it, it's it's interesting to talk about earning your own respect, right? Can't you just pay it to yourself automatically or aren't, aren't the yeah, I mean, somebody could say, "What are you doing, dummy? You're you're making yourself jump through all these hoops. You're the only person who's actually looking at it. Why don't you just um, it's sort of like, you know, cheating in a game, right? Why are you going on all these quests or doing all this stuff? Just use the cheat codes." <laughs> Uh, because it's it's partly the journey, and and at least from my experience of of working through some of these core uh, values and these mm. practices, I've I've gained a a level of you know tranquility or equanimity that uh, I definitely hadn't ever had before. And and once you realize that things that in the past would have really set you off no longer yeah. that is a, a a feeling of of kind of like pure joy <laughs> i i can relate to that um i mean i've you know this from our many conversations that one of the reasons i got into studying stoicism in the first place was anger management because i had a lot of issues with that it's not you know completely perfect at this point in time but i can look back and say wow there's a lot of things where um, I would have gotten very angry at this and probably have said something that, you know, derailed a conversation or destroyed a friendship or, you know, wrecked a business opportunity. And, and I don't I don't do that anymore, you know. Um, and it, it, you're right. There, there is a dealing with an emotion and it could be it could be anxiety. It could be. Um, aversion to things. It could be all sorts of negative emotions. Envy, right? That, that's another big one that holds people back. Realizing that you're free of that and that you, because of the progress that you've made bit by bit, you don't have to feel that over and over and over again. You're not stuck in that anymore. It does produce another emotion that you described as joy. And I think that's that's a really great way to talk about it. For some people, it might be, you know, just relief. Oh man, thanks. I don't have to do that now. But <laughs> but there's something more positive to that, and it could also produce like you know gratitude, um, and and a wish to give back. You know, a feeling like wow, this helped me. Um, I bet it could help other people. You know, which would also tie in with the pro social stuff that you're talking about. Right, and yeah. I could also, going back to this quote, like uh, the second half, don't expect to encourage good deeds and people conscious of your own misdeeds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I feel like every everything has to have like a half life. Sometimes, like you think of your um, your credit score after okay. seven years, it drops off. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so miss. So at least some misdeeds. <laughs> yeah. They you should at a certain point be freed of those. And, and it's interesting because in a lot of situations, people hold on to those things for decades, mm -hmm. you know, especially like in family situations. And and for some people, you know, like one of the things that so talks about is that your reputation isn't under your total control. And for some people, once you have shown that you are changing that you are no longer doing these misdeeds and that you are doing things that are actually pro-social yeah um they will change their their idea their your idea of what how they respect you and your reputation goes up but not for everyone and that's okay because these things are outside of our control yeah uh go ahead so just want to kind of move on a little bit and and kind of like bring in a little bit more of like why the the stoics kind of think about these things and and so the the stoics think that there are certain things that are uh goods and everything else are kind of indifference and and one of the things here is you know our desire anyone that like desires money as like that ultimate goal this kind of avarice um will will oftentimes destroy others in order to gain that maybe even like destroy the relationships with a uh, family if they yeah. consider that that money is the highest good then they will uh, potentially sacrifice anything in order to get that and we 
as we're talking about Stokes and the the thing that is actually good is our actions, and if those actions are actually you know wise, temperate, courageous, and just, if we are doing these things, we are no longer doing virtuous actions, and so putting these material things or these things that potentially give us pleasure over you know being these cardinal virtues, uh, then we are making a mistake within Stoic philosophy. Yeah. You know, Epictetus has a chapter in the discourses where he talks about somebody and their fears of uh, poverty, of becoming destitute. And he says, um, well, what is it you're really afraid of? Are you afraid like you're not going to have anything to eat? Because you can buy food pretty cheap. You just can't, you can't buy the fancy stuff that you like, that you're accustomed to. So, you know, in our days, we talk about like making beans and rice or ramen or stuff like that. I mean, not the healthiest thing, of course. And we could have a whole conversation about, you know, food scarcity and, and deserts. But Epictetus's point is pretty good. You don't, you don't need a ton of money in order to, you know, clothe yourself, feed yourself, um, get water, um, go from place to place. It's it's wanting to do it in a certain way, and then he and then he turns it on the person and he says, "You know what you're really afraid of?" And he must have known this person. You're really afraid of like what other people are going to say about you. You're you're worried. You're less worried about actually being poor, and you're you're more worried about like looking poor or being talked about as poor. And you know, and that's not actually a. Uh, bad. Yeah, I mean, what's what's the worst that can happen? So people don't invite you to their parties anymore. Well, you you can't bring anything to the party anyway because you're you're you've got nothing to bring. Um, like you've got time to do do other stuff then, and and I think that could. So there's the the positive things or viewed as positive things. I want to I want to have a ton of money, so I need to sell out this and sell out this. And then there's the avoidances, you know, the aversion to being in a bad situation. And, and he talks about that with, um, well, death, of course, but also disease, um, poverty. Um, I suppose we could extend this to like good looks, reputation. You know, the loss of those things can be very, very scary for a lot of people. Um, Position. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Or even, you know, like you think about the people who retire and they've really sunk a lot of themselves in their, their job or they lose their job, you know, because mm-hmm. of economic dislocations or downsizing. And they've they've placed a lot of their value, how they view themselves as valuable in that. And then once it's taken away, you know, they're really hurting. Yeah. I, I wrote a paper about this once. Oh, yeah. What, yeah. what was it? What uh, was it saying? Uh, it, basically, that it, it's on modern stoicism, mm. um, and it's I think I called it the locust of meaning. Oh, right. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and we're so that is saying basically. So that is in the Stoicism Today blog, which you can find on the Modern Stoicism site, and you know we want to give you uh, the actual site. So it's Modern Stoicism, all one word, dot org. I think right. Right. Um, but very similar um, that if you place your meaning at the thing that like defines you in these things that can be taken away from you, then uh, when they are taken away, then you're thrown into like a, a crisis of meaning. And if you kind of like along with stoicism, where we were, we're kind of retreating to the things that are totally within our control, if you can retreat your meaning to something that is also totally in your control, then any you know potential minor external loss of, of something isn't going to actually cause you that, that crisis of meaning. Yeah. I mean, it might still hurt, but it's not going to hurt mm-hmm. as much, at least. You know? Yeah. And you have a footing to go forward with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. I mean... The, And I think that's a significant difference. Our lives don't have to be made perfect by some philosophy of life or intentional way of living in order for us to have significant improvement in in our lives. Right. It's, it's, we talk a lot about the, uh, the sage within stoicism Mm -hmm. and that's kind of like this, you know, uh, North Star. It's it's a a goal to aspire to, but any any progress from where you are to that place, even if you never get to that place, are 
uh, have benefits in and of themselves. Yeah. And so there's there's no and value. You know, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I think a lot of people there's a, there's a perfectionism that easily gets in any sort of um, way of imp- you know self improvement. Any bit of improvement that you make, even if it doesn't like automatically change people's views on you or you still screw up or um, it doesn't work in every situation, it's still something real. It's still improvement. Yeah. So, um, you know, Greg, why do we gather together as humans? (laughs) That's a big question. I mean, I think there's I think there's a lot of uh, reasons. Some of it, I think, has to do with our our kind of animality. and it, it probably isn't just a distinctively human thing. I mean, you think about like cuddling together between animals who, who, who are different species, right? Um, mm-hmm. Like, you know, we have, we have a cat now who's the only one left of our four-legged family, but she and her sister got adopted by my wife before my wife adopted these two big dogs, and the cats got to set the agenda and the tone, you know. They're much. They were much smaller than the dogs, but you know, when the dogs were puppies, they the cats induced in them the the proper respect for cats, right? <laughs> and you know, they would they would all like cuddle together and hang out together. And every once in a while, one of them would, you know, be mean to the other one. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the things that really soured the relationship between the 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 one surviving cat and the one surviving dog was when the cat started deliberately standing up on her hind legs and eating out of the dog's bowl. Uh, you can see this betrayed look, right? So there's, there's, there's something on a very basic level uh, of gathering for comfort. And for, there's, something, there's something in our very nature. I mean, the Stoics recognize this. Um, there's there's a, a Stoic uh, called Heracles who talks about this process that in Greek is called oikiosis, and we often translate it as appropriation, which is a little abstract, but it, it includes um, self-care, self-love, sort of a natural thing inborn in us. And there's also a natural tendency, not not necessarily to love everybody, but to for that natural self-affection to reach out to things that are like us. Um, and they can be like us in being the same species. They can be like us in being our family members, but they can also be like us in just having observable needs and emotions and, you know, cuddling together for closeness. And then, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of other reasons why we gather together. Some of them not so great. I mean, we could gather together to rob somebody. Um, Mm -hmm. we, We can gather together to benefit people. Um, you know, think about Jimmy Carter, who's still out there. I guess he's 97 now, uh, building houses with Habitat for Humanity. That's a gathering process, right? Uh, right. And that it, there's a there's a point to it. So I, I, there's all sorts of reasons for for gathering. Um, what what were you thinking? What did you have in mind? Oh, I've got a number of things. You know, uh, and I was kind of thinking like specifically why are we, are we gathering for what we're about to talk about in just a moment with uh, Stoicon. Okay. And, yeah. you know, we have these things, but we also, we gather to build up big things. We gather to uh, provide, like, safety and protection for each other, but yeah. we also gather to share information and share goods and share stories. You know, just think about, like, you know, you got a couple of people wandering through the wilderness and you have a fire and you sit down you yep. share stories. Like, why not? Like, like what does it cost you? It costs you nothing. It's free to give. And uh, That's true, yeah. Um, you know, and when it comes to cons, which are conventions or conferences, um, I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting. Like, academic conferences, sometimes you go to them because you're expected to do that as part of your, your work. You have to present papers or you have to like do job interviews at them. That used to be the way it went. And people would be like, Oh, I have to go to Philadelphia for another, you know, stupid conference. And it might come like at a really inopportune time. But I mean, there's other reasons to go to conferences, um, getting to see people that you would like to get to know, you know, like academic superstars, I, I ran into quite a few of them at conferences. 
Um, or, you know, you get to know people over time and you're like, well, I'll see you next year at the conference. Um, and you have something in common. It's, it's cool to be with people who share interests with you, especially if you, you know, if you're kind of isolated. Like when I was teaching at Indiana State Prison, when I first began as an assistant professor, um, you know, I liked the guys who I was teaching, but I was just so starved for peer contact. You know, the guys would be interested, say, in the Stoics or Aristotle, but I couldn't talk with them like as, you know, peer to peer with somebody else who had been studying those things. And, and it could be anything. It could be like, you know, fishing lures. It could be um, Comic-Con coming up or, or, you know, like when we have, I'm kind of gesturing to uh, uh, the, the Wisconsin center that's only blocks from, from us. Like yeah. when they have that, that Midwest auto show, right? And all, mm-hmm. all the gearheads show up and they're, they're, they're into it. They, they think it's really yeah. cool, right? Um, so I, th- I think that's, that's an important aspect of it, getting to spend time with people who value what you value. Right. It kind of reminds me of the, when you go to college and you now have mm. you know, thousands of people and there's a group for everything and you can find those people that are like right on your wavelength. They are into all the same things that you are. And, you know, you're moved away from like your high school where you've got like, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. only so many people around and, and maybe one other person has at least some passing similar interests that you do. And now you're like, I found my people. <laughs> You know, but, and if if you're going to a place that's a professional school, so like, you know, Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design here in Milwaukee or Berkeley School of Music out in Boston or the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, um, very often you you were that one person who was, who was into this and good at that and you knew a few people and now suddenly you're in a whole school that's devoted to that. You know, for for some people, it can be disconcerting because they go from being the proverbial big fish in a small pond to being just one more person who's into art or music or cooking. Um, But but most people respond very positively to that. So I wanted to say, like, you know, once again, the the Stokes talk about us, like, trying to do things are pro-social because we're social creatures and yeah. kind of like the, the, the basis of that is like the stoic ethics. And um, we, we talk about pro-social things under like the heading of justice. What, what is the just way that one uh, acts and interacts with other people? And, um, you know, without other, you know, creatures, other people for us to actually uh, interact with, then like a lot of the ethics kind of goes out the window. That's right, yeah. And so I got the like, question I wanted to ask you was, oh. if there was no one out there to interact with, are there still ethical decisions to be made? Yeah, you mean like um, if you were the proverbial last man on Earth, right? Right. I, I think and say that there's also no like... Um, no aliens, uh, no... Uh, no and, and no like h- higher life forms greater than bacterium. Oh, okay. Wow, that's that's so. No cats, no dogs, not even spiders. You know, I'm right. I kind of like spiders myself, but um, I would say yes, but it's in an attenuated attenuated way, right? So you can't be just in relation to any other people because there's no people. I mean, you could say, well, what about people in the past? Like, you know, you save their books and stuff like that. Well, they wouldn't really care from a stoic perspective. They're gone, you know. Um, But you could still be temperate, you know. You could, I mean, (laughs) if you were the last person on earth, one of the temptations would be let's go get as drunk as possible because, you know, I can't stand this solitude. And, you know, I'll I'll eat anything that I want because, you know, who cares how fat I get or or out of shape. Um, Temperance would, would help you to not do that. And you might still need, you might still need courage. Um, I mean, you're not facing like, you know, saber tooth tigers or anything like that, but you would use the stoic virtue of courage involves like perseverance. So, and not, not despairing too. um, wisdom, you'd still need that justice. I, I don't think, I don't think that would exist if there aren't other people, um, I mean, it's not so as if, just, it's not as if justice goes away, right? Because mm-hmm. potentially, 
maybe you could clone yourself or you run into somebody else and now justice could exist in the world. You just couldn't, you couldn't make it actual without another uh, person. Is there any justice towards oneself? Um, that's a good question. In, in the stoic scheme, right? Um, I mean, I guess if you made a promise to yourself that you kept it, <laughs> As opposed to breaking it, but I I don't know. What do you think? I I'm of the opinion that there's you can still make just decisions in regard to yourself. Okay, or at least your future self. Oh, uh, your future self. Okay, how what would that look like? Uh, as you said, like you made a promise that you're going to like you know do something tomorrow, and like I I've now made you know some sort of contract with myself that like you know i'm i'm intending to do this okay but then you're like who is holding my me to this it is just me yeah yeah but <laughs> but then i look about that about like my everyday things and i i do set out goals for myself and i try to uh achieve them as much as i can um and so i guess i i see that even in you know living with other people that i do have a justice to myself when i am making these obligations to myself. Do you think that's justice or do you think that falls more under courage with like perseverance and, you know, following through on what is, what is difficult or is it both? Maybe I, I think it's both. I, I just like think about like, you know, if I were to treat another person, say like, I'm going to do this for you yeah. tomorrow. Um, it's very, very similar to I'm going to do this for myself tomorrow. I think I may have told you about a gym coach that I had when I was um, in high school who made a big impression on me, like a lifelong impression on me. Um, he scared the hell out of all of us the very first day of class. And apparently, I'll, I'll tell you this and then I'll, I'll tell you the, the, the actual point. Um, <laughs> the first day of class, he lined us up in the bleachers and he was shouting at us. I guess there'd been a problem the previous year with guys essentially engaging in acts of sexual harassment against against girls. And he wanted to make sure that we knew that was not going to be tolerated at all, you know. And we we're like, wow, who is this guy? He's very intense. But once we got to know him, he was um, incredibly fair. And he followed through on every commitment that, that he made as far as I could ever see. Um, and he, um, he would always say to us, don't cheat yourself, whether you were running or doing some sort of activity that required skill or lifting weights. It was like his mantra. And at first he'd be like, ah, that's just, you know, some silly slogan, but he really meant it. And it, and it stuck with me. And when I go and work out at the gym and I'm tempted to slack off because I'm on my third set of 12 and I'm like, ah, I, I don't need to do 12. I can do 11. I don't actually like hear the voice in my head, but it, 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 it's there, that message, don't cheat yourself. It's not don't cheat coach because he, he doesn't, you know, he's, he's gone, right? Mm -hmm. um, he's not dead, thank God. But um, he's, he and I haven't talked for 30 years. But that message, don't cheat yourself, I guess that would be like what you're talking about is justice here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. So I guess to go back, like, why do we also gather? Yeah. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, um, symposium or going to symposia, uh, you know, to for these academic conferences, present some information. It might be required of you. But we also have just, you know, general uh, meetings for mutual understandings. Mm -hmm. like, this is. You know, I guess a little bit not not quite in the the pop and circumstance of academia, but maybe like well, there's uh, not a lot of pop and circumstance there. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> I do remember a lot of wine, cheese well, and wine. Symposia originally were drinking parties, right? That's mm -hmm. that's what the word means, and and uh, quite a few of them in ancient times were philosophical, but they they still got pretty hammered. Right. <laughs> um, I just remember going to a lot of uh, physics symposia in college, and those were uh, entertaining. And they and like fun. to party? And, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. 
<laughs> Especially the um the plasma physics students. That they're like stuck there for like six years at minimum on their graduate work okay. because their uh, experiments take so long. Yeah, and, and so like they know how to like pass the time. That's good, you know. I mean, so again, so long as it's temperate, right? Um, right, right. Which, which doesn't mean that you never you never indulge yourself, but you you know you do so within limits. Um, but let, let, yeah, let's come back to talking about um, Stoic Stoicism and Stoic Han, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so every year for the last ten years, the what's become the Modern Stoicism Organization has had a conference. And it was face to face for the first uh, eight years. I was able to go to three of them in recent years and, and provide workshops in uh, New York City and Toronto and, and London. And those are the main places they've been held. They also did one in Athens one year, which would have been kind of cool to go to, but I, I didn't. I didn't want to try to you know do that in the middle of the semester. Uh, and then there are these smaller. Stoicon X events that are all over the world that have popped up in like the last four or five years, I'd say. Uh, we actually had one here in Milwaukee um, that both Dan and I spoke at uh, two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. And that was in person. Yeah. And then once COVID hit, we had to figure out what to do. And similar to what we're doing here, um, you know, doing things remotely. Stoicon went online and it was really interesting what happened because you miss out on some things, right? You obviously don't get to hang out with people after a talk and like go and have a conversation with them or have lunch or dinner or have a drink or stuff like that or even see them at the airport. But it opened up access to people all over the world. Obviously, in some time zones, better than others. Australia, it's kind of difficult to participate in a New York time event, but um, especially if it's an all-day event. But it right. last, so in in previous years with face-to-face conferences, the most we'd ever get in one room was about three hundred and fifty or four hundred people tops. Um, last year, fourteen hundred people registered for Stoicon. And I think the most that were ever on on the Zoom call at, and at one given time were a thousand people. So that's a thousand people listening to a speaker talk about some interesting aspect and communicating with each other in the chat and you know participating in something. This year we've all it's going to be held you know shortly, um, and uh, we've already got a thousand people at this point, and we're probably going to have even more people. Um, so you know, there's that, and then we record. I mean, the... and, and and Greg, yeah, uh, are are you doing something with Stokeon this year? <laughs> so, my wife and I, Andy, uh, who are along with Dan, the uh, uh, co-organizers of the Milwaukee Stoic Fellowship, um, we undertook to become the the organizers for Stoicon itself this year. And in in part because a guy who handled it in the past, Donald Robertson, he's done three of them. Uh, He, this year he was like, eh, I don't want to do it again. It's a lot of work. Um, So I I asked Andy and she said, yeah, let's, let's do it. So, and and we've got, we've got other helpers too. Um, We have uh, a guy who handles all the tech stuff. We have, um, my friend Harold, who's doing the lightning round talks, Dan is actually participating by being one of the uh, breakout session leaders for Tim LeBond's workshop. So there's a lot, a lot of people doing things, you know, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a great conference. I've always enjoyed going to it. Um, you meet a lot of people and there's, there's usually really great talks. And this time we made it more interactive. So not only are there talks, you know, or somebody gets up and maybe they have some slides and they go through their their thing. We're also doing panels where you can ask questions and we have a workshop and, you know, all all that sort of uh, stuff as well to make it really interactive. Um, So it's, go ahead. By the time that, you know, you hear this, if if you're not already there, it's probably done. But uh, all of the talks will be uh, on YouTube on the Modern Stoicism channel. Um, just, you know, uh, search for either Modern Stoicism or Stoicon 2021, and that should pull up all of them. It'll, it'll be a little while before they get posted, because I'm the one who has to do all the editing. But 
<laughs> so <laughs> they'll get rolled out bit by bit. But yeah, it's it's. I mean, that's another kind of cool thing about this. Doing it online means that we have it, there's there's a time and place that it happens, right? Uh, it's a virtual place, but then it kind of exists afterwards a la carte. You know, you can go and, and be like, I want to hear Nancy Sherman's keynote address because I heard that was pretty good, you know, or I want to see what Tim LeBond was doing in his workshop or <laughs> or uh, what uh, Aldo Danucci is doing down in what, Brazil, I do believe. Yeah, he's he's a professor down in, in Brazil. He's one of our, our speakers as well. Um, so that'll be that'll be quite interesting. Um and we actually have a team too, Kai, Kai Whiting and Leonidas Konstantakos, who do some writing together and, and present together. Uh, Leo, Leo, by the way, just, I think, just defended his dissertation. Nice. So he's now Dr. Leo, I think, um, I... Which, is, which is good for him. Um, so there's going to be, yeah, there's going to be a lot of cool stuff. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I... I see you behind you. You've got this great background of <laughs> the Stoa, the, yeah, the actual Stoa that we all talk about. And so, um, the Stoa is a you know a, a painted porch or a, a big uh, covered colonnade. Um, and so, you know, instead of those like nice bright white marble that you see behind you, in the time that we we're actually talking about, this would have been co- uh, painted with really bright and vibrant colors. Like yeah. The, the, the Greeks and the Italians back in the day loved color, and they painted it on everything. Yeah. Um, but it's it's a place to to gather. That's the whole point. Is you know, once again, the the whole the, the, a centerpiece of Stoicism is it's not about a person or their ideas, but it was like, how do we define ourselves? Oh, we're the guys that gather in this place in the Stoa. Well, and originally they weren't called. Um... They were, they were called Zenonians because Zeno was teaching there, and then they became the people of the Stoa, the Stoics, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So I just I love that like part of it is like they'd go there after being in the gymnasium, and I'm like just thinking, Yo, bro, do you even know what the good life entails? <laughs> I don't know if everybody went to, to to the gym, but yeah, certainly some of them came from there, or from their jobs in the marketplace, or yeah. I mean, that's a good point. It, it provided. Uh, it provided a center where you could go and you could know that somebody else was going to be interested in what you had to say or what you wanted to ask them or, you know, the topics that were on your mind. I guess, I guess that works for a lot of other things too, right? Yeah. It was just finding these gathering places and, you know, uh, fortunate or unfortunate, depending on how you look on it. Um, you know, we are in a time where we have technology that allows us to gather, and so we have our virtual stoas. Yeah, and and I I see that as a, a great thing. As a matter of fact, I kind of think that without the internet and mobile technology and YouTube and all these things that are you know tied together and permeate our existence, you you wouldn't see this um, massive surge of interest in stoicism i mean there's books right and, and the books mm-hmm. books are important but you know it's not as if this is getting promoted a lot in the traditional media and it's and it's not really coming that much out of like you know academics and the university mm-hmm. it's something that gets its hold through um what the internet has to offer mm-hmm. i mean i i wouldn't know any of these people who i'm introducing at the event if it wasn't well except for uh andy um (laughs) who i'm married to uh if if it hadn't been for the internet you know so speaking of other things that you can actually do there are uh there are a number of stoicon x events uh coming up that are the these regional things and Mm -hmm. some might even have like in-person events but there's also a a whole thing that's called Stoic Week, which I think is like the 
It starts the 18th of October this year. Yeah. Yeah. And it runs for an entire week. It is it is a stoic week. And what you do is there's like a handbook that you download and an online class that you sign up for. It's totally free. And um, each day you have like a morning reading and an evening reading and there's a practice for the day. There's usually like a theme, you know, to, to be doing something with. And um, you keep track of stuff and you interact with other people who are doing this class, a lot of whom are doing it for the first time and some of whom are doing it like as a tune-up. That's the way I look at my uh, – this will be like my – I don't know, sixth or seventh time going through it. Um, and it, and it's, it's really helpful. Um, we have data. Tim Laban is one of the main researchers who's been compiling stuff on this for years. We've got data that actually shows that trying to live like a Stoic in a consistent way for a week makes your life better. It changes your attitudes about things. I mean, it's not going to like radically... <laughs> <laughs> revise your life uh, but but it, it does make things better and so it's quite interesting to to find that out so uh, a little excerpt from it you can also find more at uh, modern stoicism dot com slash stoic dash week uh, but uh, a little uh, preview is like you will learn about how the ancient philosophy of Stoicism can be adapted to help us lead better lives. The course combines general theory with more specific step-by-step -step guidance on certain Stoic exercises. These materials have been prepared by experts in the field and give you an unusual and completely free of charge opportunity for personal development. Yeah, and this is this is kind of a a cool and unique thing. I mean. Over 10,000 people usually these days participate in the course each year. Um, the numbers have just been going up and up and up every every year. And a lot of them are first timers. Um, some people will go through the week together, like some of the um, little stoic organizations here and there will like do it with themselves. There's um, classes that, that do it, academic classes and, you know, philosophy or um, classics or other, other related uh, fields like that. And um, it would be kind of cool to see something like this done for other philosophies of life. You know, like yeah. there could be an Epicurus week or there could be a live like a cynic week, you know, or <laughs> an Aristotelian I, I don't, week I don't or know. something like that. I don't know if anyone can get through being like a Diogenes. Well, you wouldn't necessarily want to be that guy, right? There's other cynics you could model <laughs> yeah. yourself after. Um but yeah, I mean, it's it's a. I mean, if if you're the kind of person who likes experimenting with changing your life and seeing what that does to you, this would be a really great thing to do. Even if you, even if you're not particularly interested in stoicism, it would it would add one more thing to that list. And if you are interested in stoicism, it's a great way to learn more about it. Yeah, you actually have a, a course in which you uh, sometimes asks your students to. Uh... Uh, try out certain things, correct? Oh, you're talking about my course at Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I get to teach that every three semesters, and it's very popular. The students really enjoy it. And it, it's not just um, stoicism. We we usually do like five units. So this last time we, we started with um, – after we do some basic stuff about mindfulness and, you know, philosophy as a way of life and practices, we did the Epicurean tradition. We did the utilitarians and uh, effective altruism. Uh, and then we switched to the cynics and the stoics. And then we looked at, um, in a very selective way, Buddhism, you know, because we got this vast, vast religious and philosophical tradition. So it was mostly looking at some uh, Theravadan techniques and then Pure Land Buddhism and, and uh, Zen Buddhism. Um, and then the semester is over. But each week, the students would have some practices that they were supposed to experiment with and they would keep records and and sometimes they'd say well this th i didn't like this at all <laughs> this, this didn't work for me you know uh and sometimes they'd be like wow this really changed my perspective or this really helped me with this this issue i suppose i should probably 
do more surveying of them and start using some more rigorous things to like see whether doing this stuff, you know, say lowers their anxiety. But I, ha- I just haven't gotten to that. Uh, so far, I've been de- just developing content for them. But they really enjoy it. And, and I think they really enjoy it because they get to – they don't just learn something. They get to apply it. They get to see right. if, it, if it fits into their life. And so here is an opportunity for you to do at least a, a fifth of what Greg uh, has his <laughs> students do. Um, and, and you can spend a week on it. Like it is either just a challenge for you to try something out new or to deepen your experience of stoicism if you are interested in it. But it's also a, a very large and ongoing social experiment. Yeah. In which That's a good way to describe gathering, it. They're gathering data. Yeah. And so they, they, they try to uh, they send you through a questionnaire about like how you feel about kind of life and the general uh, beneficial way that you're looking at life at the beginning of the week. And then do that again. We do a comparison of over that week. And one of the biggest things, the, the thing that has repeatedly come up in these is the thing that is highest correlated to starting to live the stoic lifestyle is this feeling of zest. Or um, a uh, what's it? Uh, living life with great enthusiasm and energy. <laughs> um, and so, like, this, and this is sometimes this is... defined as like. Oh, sorry. This Go is ahead. sometimes defined um, along the lines of, you know, are you looking forward to each new day? Do I feel excited about the upcoming day? Am I brimming with excitement about life? Um, do I try to live each day to the fullest? And things along those lines. Yeah, and I was going to say, this was a big surprise to Tim LeBon. He actually reported on it in Sto- at, at the Stoicon 2018, which was in London. And he got up there with all those charts and he was like, so I'm not quite sure how this turn came out this way, but zest was the trait that, you know, went up the highest. And then he had to say, well, that's kind of cool. What What is zest, right? And it's in some ways counterintuitive. You'd think, well, Stoics, okay, practicing this, I won't be as anxious, you know, I'll be, I'll be more resilient. It's mostly like negative stuff. But zest is very, very positive the way that psychologists construe it. And so this is kind of a cool finding that, doing this stuff will actually make you feel happier in your life. Wow. So I think um, to kind of like wrap this up, let's talk about a, a practice, the, the festival yeah. mindset. So um, this is a, a kind of a reframing technique um, of, you know, think of, you can either go and be out in the, the streets and, uh, and you can uh, be, bombarded with the cacophony of all the the noise and the the hustle and bustle and the the seeming um just randomness of everything and you can be like disturbed and annoyed by all these things around you (laughs) (laughs) yeah or or you can do something like a reframing and now now instead of like i'm i'm beset by all these annoyances and these people and they're getting in my way but i'm now at a festival that this is something that can um, I'm enjoying the revelry and all these people are all my guests and I get to live life and enjoy it with them at all times do you want to read that uh, you got a great quote from Epictetus yes. there about this so when you're alone you should call this condition tranquility and freedom and think of yourself like the gods and when you are with many You shouldn't call it a crowd or a trouble or uneasiness, but festival and company and contentedly accept it. That's a nice line. Do you want to lead us out? Because we're getting close to time. uh, Yeah. So Epictetus' teacher. Yes. From Missonius Rufus, we leave you these words. For mankind, evil is injustice and cruelty and indifference to a neighbor's trouble while virtue is brotherly love and goodness and justice and beneficence and concern for the welfare of your neighbor.